2021's fourth edition of the Anahita Speaker Series, hosted jointly by Carnegie India and the Vedika Scholars Program for Women. Carnegie India is a New Delhi-based think tank with deep analytical research focused on three subject areas, security studies, technology and society, and political economy. This research has become more significant at this time of global crisis, when many of our long-standing assumptions are being tested. This is the time for us to rethink, reimagine, and build a better society. It is also the context for the relevance of the Anahita Speaker Series, where we have the privilege of hosting a woman, a leader in her field, to share her professional and personal journey. These conversations celebrate their achievements, draw lessons from their hardships, and hope to inspire young professionals, especially women, at the threshold of their careers. I now hand over to Rupa Vasudev to introduce the Vedika Scholars Program, our guest, and the run of events. Thank you, Shivani. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Carnegie India and the Vedika Scholars Program and Anahita Speaker Series. Before we move on to welcoming our guest for this session, I'll take a quick moment to briefly introduce the Vedika Scholars Program. The Vedika Scholars Program for Women is a unique postgraduate program that integrates management studies with a liberal arts curriculum, aiming towards the holistic growth of its scholar. The program's mission is to prepare women with potential towards the trajectory of fulfilling careers as inspiring professionals and leaders of the 21st century who are equipped to break the proverbial glass ceiling. At Vedika, we recognize the importance of diversity and we hope to leverage it for a better and equal society and participate in the global movement to empower women all over the world. Our guest for this, for this evening is Lakshmi Karunagaran. Lakshmi is an educator and a communication professional based in Bangalore. Over the years, she has worked with children experiencing social exclusion in government schools, special needs schools, remedial schools, and in dis disadvantaged communities. In 2017, she founded the Buguri Community Library Project, an inter-school library and arts center for over 1,000 children of waste pickers across five locations in Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. A very warm welcome to you, Lakshmi. I now hand over to Kanika, who will be the moderator for the session. Thank you. Thank you, Rupa and Shivani. Good evening to everyone, and a very warm welcome to our audience. Thank you so much, Lakshmi, for being here. A small note for the audience first. We are taking questions on both platforms, Zoom and YouTube via the comment section. So I think this is an important time to have this conversation when children have been severely affected by the pandemic. Their education, interaction with other children, mental health, and the fear of the third wave. As a parent, I know it's been hard, but I cannot begin to imagine the impact on children of underserved communities. Lakshmi works with such children and empowers them with art, books, and safe spaces. So let's start with your personal journey first, Lakshmi. You started your career as a telecom engineer, moved to a communication specialist, and now you're an educator. Tell us what drove these transitions. What gave you the strength and the courage to take potential risks in your career at such a young age? Part of it was madness, but I'll talk about it <laughs> a little later. Uh, thank you for, to Carnegie and uh, to Vedika for inviting me and everybody who has joined. Thank you for joining in such grim times. I know each family right now is uh, going through a lot. Everybody is personally affected. The tragedy is huge. So uh, I really, really appreciate it that you have taken time to conduct this event and to join it as well. Uh, thank you, Kanika, for that question. Uh, I, I um, had to join college in the turn of the century. That was 2000, uh, you know, 21 years ago. And uh, I'm from Bangalore. I mostly grew up in Bangalore. And there was a very famous saying in Bangalore at that point uh, that if you throw a stone in Bangalore, it either hits a, a dog or an IT professional. 
So <laughs> that was the expanse and the choices you basically had because everybody got became an engineer, everybody became IIT professional. That was the way to go, you know. And I come from a very middle class family. My parents' aspirations leaned the, the same way. And many times for women and many times even others, you know, you, one doesn't, uh, it, career path negotiations with, parents is quite a challenge, you know, so and it was for me as well, you know, and uh, my parents wanted me to do IT and somehow I had to nod my way through it. So I actually uh, uh, graduated as a telecom engineer, like you said, and uh, quite um, against my own will. And then the path was IT because after that one gets, you know, it's uh, it's the path that fo follows and I joined an IT career in uh, at that time, you know, quite a well-known uh, IT um, organization, Infosys. And um, I started to do what everybody does, sit at the desk for nine hours, code, you know, and try to look out and see when is the end of the day and run, you know, and then long ride back home. Uh, so, but I very quickly realized it's something that I don't enjoy at all. Thankfully, I was in Infosys, which had this very peppy um, campusy culture. So it had, you know, all these uh, photography clubs and, you know, CSR was happening. There was all kinds of other kind of clubs that you could be part of. So one never found me at my seat. I was the worst team member, I guess, because I would always be in these uh, other places that you should not be at. But they had to keep me because they had to have headcount. So, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that it was very clear at, at a very early time in my career that this path is not for me. And, uh, but what part was for me was also not clear. So it, it had to be slowly, slowly understood from what I was seeing, I was get, becoming interested in. So uh, I knew I wanted uh, uh, a job which, in which I interacted with people, I interacted with communities. It had an element of transformation. It had some, it helped me tell stories. It helped other people tell their stories. So these were all things that I knew and somehow I wanted it to find its way. So um, like I was volunteering, I was also volunteering with the communication department at Infosys, the design studio there, which has this beautiful pyramid-like structure. And uh, so very magically at one point, there was an opening for a new role uh, where they were opening something called InfiTV, which was an internal communication TV channel. And uh, uh, I just jumped in and I said, will you take me in? I have no experience, I have not studied, but will you take me in? I'm super excited, you know? And, uh, but I guess they saw some potential and took me on thankfully. And that was the first shift in my career. And uh, for the next six to seven years, I spent in corporates doing uh, communications and mostly internal and corporate communications. In, I moved from emphasis to other companies as well, but I stayed in that role and that I enjoyed as well until a point where I felt uh, there was a different calling. And this time the calling was to work with children. And I think it started right at the beginning because even with the corporates, I was very involved in CSR and especially CSR that took me to government schools. And uh, so I was very interested in projects that led to government schools and to be able to see these schools. And uh, so somewhere I, I think it just grew on me and it kept telling me to maybe pursue it. And uh, so I, at one point, uh, really quit cold uh, and uh, said that I should take a risk of about a year to look at where this calling is from. And at that point, I uh, was in Delhi uh, and I quit and I took about six to eight months to figure a few things out and moved to Kolar KGF, which is a gold mining um, um, you know, town outside KGF in a village. And I worked with five government schools, completely uh, self-sponsored. Um, where does the courage come from is an interesting question. And it is, I think, an important question to be reflected on, especially for young women. I, when I made my first shift, I was 22, 23. When I made my second shift, I was about 29. And I guess I'm speaking to uh, an audience which is around the same age. Um, the courage, I think, comes from multiple aspects. One is the practicality of many of these things. I mean, one does 
is led by madness many times, like I was saying, of just wanting to do something and experiment. But also, one also needs to recognize one's advantages and privileges. And I must put it out. And I guess I had some of them. One was um, I did not have any dependents. I didn't have children. I didn't have parents to take care of. I was financially, I had thankfully paid off most of my loans. There was a sense of financial uh, independence. There was some amount of savings, not too much uh, to you know, uh, fall back upon. And uh, maybe a little bit of uh, strength to say that one year I will eat out of my savings and do this experiment. You know, So yes, that to an ecosystem of friends and family members. Like for me, my partner at that time was very, very, very supportive of, uh, of the calling that I called. Um, while many, many people did not believe in it. Like my parents were very disturbed by that fact that I was doing this. Um, but to find that uh, tr uh, you know ecosystem of support immediately around you would be a huge privilege and a for, to be, I was very fortunate I had it. Um, also, I think in terms of the readiness to self-learn, to if you don't find it, find other people who are not in your circles, who've done these, made these decisions, you know, go to them, seek guidance, read about what people have done. So that also, I think even music sometimes inspires you in different ways. So a lot of things, I guess, came together at that point for me to make these multiple shifts. Yeah, and there's a conspiracy of the universe, of course, that. That's really interesting how you found your calling and went for it. I think a lot of young women and men can relate to that. And like you said, the support system is crucial. Yes, yes. So now uh, let's talk about some of the work that you're doing currently. Uh, the yeah. Baguri Community Library that you started has a very interesting name. And for the benefit of the audience, uh, it means spinning top in Kannada. So tell us the thinking behind this name and elaborate uh, on what you do for us, please. Yeah, so maybe I'll start from where I was. So I was about 30 years old when I uh, took this leap, went to Kolar. Um, another reason I went there was because I think um, I had, uh, of course, uh, told myself that if, if I'm going to choose this road, which is around social work and education, I'm not going to make a lot of money. You know, and uh, I need to learn because I'm not educated in I don't have that background and I need to learn from the ground. And I knew something about myself was that I I'm pretty much like learning from the ground. So since then, I think after Kola, the first year I spent at Kola uh, with uh, government schools, I started using arts as the medium to uh, communicate, talk to children. And, uh, and um, you know, a lot of it was through books and storytelling. And that's how it sort of started. Um, and since then, in the last eight years, I have basically spent, like uh, Rupa was also saying, uh, I've thrown myself into different circumstances and different communities of children and uh, in, in India and outside to understand um, how better can one use arts as a medium to work with children, uh, as a space of learning and as a space of healing, both. And uh, uh, this, this sort of five years ago led to me creating this program. Uh, so Bugri Community Library Project is a part of a larger organization called Hasiru Dala. And Hasiru Dala works with uh, informal waste pickers in uh, uh, Karnataka and in Andhra Pradesh and in Tamil Nadu. And uh, their children, they, was, they wanted to start a children's program. And their program, which was already there, was largely in terms of social uh, educational support, uh, scholarships and educational loans. But when I went into and uh, like understood the, the ground realities of where the children are, because it is a community with the highest number of dropout rates among children, especially girls. So uh, I really, I mean, what, what, what struck me was that the children have very little spaces of their own. Uh, they, they, they don't fi find those spaces in a, either their homes, in their communities, everything is sort of a threat, you know. And schools is really scary because they're most times first generation learners and it is not easy for them. So they don't have a safe space. And um, libraries, because I've been influenced by libraries and I, I think libraries hold a very, very, very um, important part of my life. Uh, I grew up in on a street where the end of the street, there was a small library. So I, and that library 
literally changed my life. Uh, libraries became uh, the way in which I thought this could be done. So libraries as a safe space uh, for children. So we started our first library in uh, Bangalore in 2017. And uh, since then we have been basically um, looking at this as a model. And we've since then opened 12 libraries across two states. And uh, yeah, so basically it's an after school program. Uh, can I share something, some pictures maybe? And uh, the, the audience would be able to maybe further relate to what I'm talking about. So yeah, it's called the Bugri Community Library Program and Bugri, like uh, Kanika said, means a spinning top. The idea was to give a spin to the life of the children. So we basically are an after-school program and we work with the children of waste pickers. And this is the time when children come after school and uh, they come and spend four to five hours in our library. They read, um, we have storytelling uh, sessions, we have uh, art sessions, we have uh, read aloud sessions um, and uh, they build the library with us. So these pictures are of children painting the library uh, with other artists. Uh, so everything that they want on the walls go onto the walls. And it is also a space for therapy, for example, many children that we work with go through immense amount of trauma. So we have an ongoing creative arts-based therapy program, which basically addresses children who are going through trauma. And uh, we, yeah, we have these individual uh, uh, reading programs. This, for example, is something that came out of, uh, you know, the art therapy program where children, girls, uh, you know, uh, for a year worked about, worked on understanding menstruation. And uh, at the end of the year, and this was through different kind of art forms, because they have a certain kind of, um, what do I say, uh, uh, ritual, which they were very confused about. So they use their space to understand. So it's a space to basically process for children, because many children don't find spaces to process, to process their thoughts, to articulate their thoughts, to tell their stories. So after a year, they were able to articulate the story of this ritual that was so confusing for many of the girls when they hit their first period. So the left that you see is a book that they came up with, uh, which basically decodes this ritual demystifies this ritual and it's a gift to their community whoever girl, whichever girls hits their first period is able to read this book and understand what will happen to them uh, on the right for example is a, a page from a book that the boys worked on this was a group of boys that were, were in therapy uh, and this we were this was a, a community where there was a lot of gender violence so this was suddenly we had a group of young boys who wanted to cook and interestingly, in their communities, they're not allowed to cook. It's the role of the women. So it was the, only in the library that they could cook. So the boys through the year cooked different things and it was each cooking uh, activity was a project. And they came up with an illustrated book on the recipes that they uh, you know, cooked on. So these are different kinds of projects that we do depending upon where these communities are. And um, I think it has its individual impact in terms of um, how it allows children to be recognized and acknowledged in the community, that they have a voice and they have something to say. For example, the uh, picture on the right that you see where you see this large puppet that children is, uh, are holding, uh, this, this picture was taken about, uh, 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 I mean, the, at the, as the ending of a, a workshop where children made puppets out of uh, uh, waste. And the space where they are putting up this performance is where a murder had happened in the community. And that space had become you know, inaccessible to children. And this right under, uh, as you can see, a plastic wrapped uh, maker statue. So um, it is to give access to children to voice their opinion, to process their thoughts, to find spaces for healing, and like you say, to create safe spaces for children. Yeah, I'm going to end this. <clears throat> so yeah, this, that is uh, the current project that I'm working on. Before this, of course, like uh, Rupa was saying that I was involved in other projects, which was again using arts as a medium to help children come to a space where they're open to learning. Uh, what we believe is that children who are traumatized or who don't have spaces to handle their emotions 
are blocked from learning. There is, they're not able to explore their full potential. So there needs to be spaces that helps them articulate. Thank you so much, Lakshmi, for sharing those images. They really give us a good idea and we can see that they're truly safe, good, nice, bright environments for these children. Um, so I'll move on to my next question. What were some of the challenges that you faced while you were setting up these libraries? Uh, did, did you get any pushback from the parents, from the children, from the communities? Um, yeah, for any, not only our project, I think for any community uh, project, for anybody who enters a community project, there are a few challenges. Some of the challenges are which, which come within the community and which come outside the community. A big advantage for us was that we had already worked with the adults in the communities. So we, uh, it was easier for us to then, there was a sense of trust that was there. But some, most times with community projects, the biggest hurdle is trust. How do you build as an outsider, as you enter their space and you want to interact with them, learn something, do something, create a program, how do you create trust? Uh, how and where does that trust evolve from? How do you as an outsider enter this community? Where do you stand? These are questions that you would ask. Do you, are you talking down at the community? Are you talking to the community? Are you standing with the community? Is it up, is it down? How do you create that ecosystem of trust with the community? And that is what that leads to uh, dialogue. And unless there is a dialogue with the community, I don't think any community project will be successful. You will be you know, working in some isolation where you one goes with their understanding and agenda. And those are the kind of projects which never is sustainable. So unless you bring in community inclusion and you are with the community and understanding their current challenges and turbulences and, uh, and you are ready to learn as well, you know, and you are ready to respect where they're coming from, it is not going to happen. So to find that sweet spot with the community and to be transparent with them, that is a big challenge, you know, to reach that space where you are trusted. Um, so that is, and it's, is, I think one of, it's a make or break for any community, uh, any, any program. Uh, that is a big challenge within the community. Outside the community, of course, uh, you know, there is the challenge of getting the right kind of people, for the kind of work that I do, which is library work, you know, one imagines library to be, shh, don't speak, don't make a noise silently. I mean, that is not the kind of community libraries we are running. Here is where you can come have, you know, it's an art space. So it is a very different ambience. So where do you get uh, trained librarians to do that? For me, at least, that was one of the big, big challenge. There is the challenge for resources, for money, for funding. Uh, also, I work with waste picker community, a community which has been marginalized and uh, there are certain stereotypes uh, with the community, you know, they're considered, um, they're really like uh, considered one of the most marginalized. How do we change the way people look at the waste picker community? And that is a, that's been a huge part of not only Bugri's work, but also Hasiru Dala's work to look at them as silent uh, you know, environmentalists who are very quietly picking up waste that you discard or, or any of us discard and picking up recyclables from it and making sure that it doesn't reach the landfill. So it is a very important work that they do. And how can we recognize that community? That was also a huge challenge. We also, I mean, also not, not only us, but by the other communities that work with, for example, politically mar marginalized, or politically, um, uh, you know, some, some communities which have other kind of challenges. Um, and that is a challenge. So it depends upon the social um, space from which this economic space that this community comes from. And uh, I think one, the challenges will reflect, uh, you know, the specifics of the community. Thanks, Lakshmi. That's really interesting to know the ground realities, which, you know, which we don't get to know otherwise. Um, so tell us now, the, how did the pandemic affect all your work, the libraries, the art centers, are the first, for, or the second wave hit us all really hard. How was yeah. that different from the first wave? And what, is, what are your thoughts on the third wave? Are you, are you, how worried are you for the third wave? Yeah. So um, I, I would I will specifically want to talk about how the pandemic has affected the waste because, of course, we are 
and uh, from i mean we are more privileged uh, <laughs> we 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 have uh, homes we have food we don't have to worry about that um, so the waste pickers so a, a bit of a definition i want to give is uh, there are, um, because there is a sense of confusion sometimes. So when I speak about waste pickers, I'm talking about informal waste pickers. So those people who go from dump to dump and pick waste and recyclables, they are not a part of the uh, larger formal um, municipality uh, solid waste management framework. So these are independent people who were formerly called rack pickers. Now we don't use that word anymore, it's obsolete. So. Uh, Waste pickers had a major crisis in the first uh, first wave because waste pickers for any city are, I believe, the backbone of the solid waste management system. In, in Bangalore alone, when we did the study in 2012, they were, Bangalore was uh, creating 3,000 tons of waste every day. And uh, 1,500 tons of that waste was going through 20,000 waste pickers in this city. So you can imagine what those numbers would look like for larger cities like Mumbai and Delhi. So waste pickers, form a big role in terms of making sure that your waste doesn't reach landfills. So, uh, but unfortunately, while waste management was looked at essential service, waste pickers were not look in, looked at as essential service providers, because obviously, uh, you know, they were not recognized for the work that they do. And they were not frontline workers, so they were not getting, you know, the benefits that uh, the frontline workers were getting. So that was a huge problem form of exclusion. Unfortunately, they were also being, I mean, they, they were frontline workers. So they were, there was always the threat of being exposed to material and waste that was infected, taking back it back home to their wives and children. And, you know, and many waste pickers, about 50% of the waste pickers are women. And um, uh, obviously within their communities as well, they felt many other neighbors felt that they should not be there. So there were instances where they were trying to be chased out of communities for uh, doing the work that they do. So this was the first wave. Fortunately, the first wave did not hit the poor. And uh, out of the 30,000 families that we work with, we've not had any deaths in the first wave. The story of the second wave, as we all know, is not the same. It has hit the poor and uh, we've already had seven, eight deaths within the, our own community, even after really, really working very hard and making sure they're provided with uh, proper COVID care. So uh, second wave definitely has impacted their homes, their income, their, uh, the, their um, access to COVID care when it comes to poor. I mean, most, uh, at least Bangalore BBMP has been very slow to respond. Um, and uh, of course, the impact on children, we all know what the di digital divide has done to the children, given that it's a, it's a community where, you know, most dropouts were happening, and five years of our work where we had put all the children back into schools and has now shattered, literally shattered, we don't know where to start from coming. And of course, there is the distress of migration, the distress of uh, poverty, not having enough food on the table. Much of that is uh, driving young children back to work. So we see, uh, see a huge spike in child labor. The children that I work with have also, I mean, of course, there has been a Child Labor Act amendment in 2016, which almost legalizes um, uh, you know, 14 plus year old children at this point in time who don't have schools to go to work. Um, so that is extremely unfortunate. And uh, they have been provided with no support system. And uh, of course, you know, digital India and digital online services for the poor is a joke right now. Thank you, Lakshmi, for that. Um, just pivoting away a little bit from the pandemic. Um, yeah. I have one more question before we take audience questions. Sure. Uh, I know you've uh, written some uh, articles on mental health of children as well. And at this present time, all parents are concerned about the men mental well-being of the kids. Uh, parents, especially women in the family, are taking on all kinds of roles. How do you think that they can take on the role of a counselor as well at this point? Oh, God. Kanika, I think we should have burdened the parents to take on another role because it's not, I think it's not possible. I mean, I, I completely, my heart goes out to the women and men also who, who are at home trying to, you know, do their own work, working from home, trying to manage uh, uh, children sometimes with almost no help. Um, I would, 
I would, I mean, I'm not, I don't have a child myself. So I, I, it's not coming from direct experience from what I can only pass on what I'm seeing, I'm hearing and what we are talking about in the, in the, in, in, in the circuit, uh, circuit of therapists and, you know, educators and what messages we are giving to parents. Um, so um, basically, I think all parents at the first level should take care of themselves. I think that is the first thing that we should do, that many times parents forget about themselves and everything else is priority. Um, and one should know that how the parents feel greatly impacts how the children feel. So if the child parents are distressed, if the parents are depressed, if the parents are anxious, it will flow to the children. The children will grab these energies and it will affect them. So. Parents, while being depressed, cannot expect their children to be happy. You know, it doesn't work that way. So one is that to recognize that you don't have to be a counselor. You just have to be a parent who takes care of her herself or himself and uh, is a slightly more empathetic parent to the child. So uh, many things that we are uh, uh, seeing right now among children in terms of anxiety, in terms of uh, like, uh, I remember in the first wave, uh, Childline in the first two weeks got 50,000 calls from children, you know, so there is a lot of distress among children. So um, there is um, worrying, there is anxiety among children, there is sleeplessness, there is nightmares, there is a, a, a sense of a, um, of being abandoned. What will happen if I lose my parents? You know, that, that, uh, that kind of fear. Um, it can also play out in different other way, digital addiction, that they are not seeing anything beyond, beyond their device. It's all coping mechanisms sometimes for children to be able to see it that way, you know, and to be kinder to them. Um, what we prescribe to parents and we try also through our program to do is to make sure that the child has a routine and uh, the child is able to use different parts of their brains and their bodies during the day, but their routine sort of does that for them. Creating a sense of independence for the children that they don't feel dependent all the time on their parents because children sometimes can become extremely needy when they're anxious. Uh, spending more time with children as much as possible and uh, doing something more that brings joy to both parents and children. So, and not, I mean, I think one of the questions that we face from parents the most is saying, in them saying how helpless they feel in not having answers and uh, answers that they have to make up, the pressure of the answers that they have to make up. And I, I think trying to make up an answer may not I mean, I may not prescribe it, Depend, of course, it's about child to child and parent to parent. It is the time to be as transparent as possible with the child and to believe that the child will have that maturity with you and will traverse through you through that process. Um, and to not um, hide because the child can understand that you're hiding. So to be empathetic and transparent is very important. If you don't have the answers to say, one doesn't have, it's extraordinary circumstances and one doesn't know. And just to say one doesn't know. I think that's really great advice. A routine, self-care for the parents and the transparency. I think that's yeah. really um, going to help the children as much as possible at this point. Thank you. Uh, so thank you so much, Lakshmi, for that. I think now we can get to the audience questions. Uh, sure. So uh, Piyush Aripana has asked on Zoom, uh, yeah. Did you map or were you able to determine the impact of your library project? Were you able to? Uh, and, I mean, I think uh, for specific projects, yes, we always take feedbacks for specific projects. Uh, we take a yearly feedback from children and from parents and from community, but we have frankly shied away from creating a, 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 a framework of sorts. Maybe we might, we might explore it, uh, but for specific feedbacks, we do. Uh, in, the impact comes in various ways. You know, we see that the dropout rates come down among communities. We see community pack, children's participations in community uh, events and decisions within the community. Uh, we see impact of children going out uh, and participating in different events, doing things. So it's more qualitative uh, uh, feedback that we get in terms of where they are. For example, uh, I can give you a, a one or two examples. Uh, I was in Mysore and it's, I think last year, and I was talking to some children about 
how the library has changed their worlds. And one of the children, there were many, many stories, two of them I remember more clearly. One of the boys said that I won't, I don't even know if I would be alive if I, if this was not this community because this child had lost both his parents and he was extremely depressed. And he felt that uh, the library is his family. This is where he comes for friends. And his own siblings had asked him to drop out of school. He wanted to go to school. They wanted him to work. So he was very, very depressed. And it is through the support and the family and the kinship that he found at the library that he feels that he's doing well. Uh, he's back to school. He is going, he's doing all kinds of other courses because he's a great artist. Uh, that the pos world of possibilities opened up for this child. There was another girl who said that, you know, Nobody knew me in school, you know, I just existed somewhere in the last bench. But uh, uh, since the library opened and I started to participate in all of these events, suddenly I, I am in my school also seen. I have an opinion about things. I participate in different things. Now the teachers call me when they have to do a drama or they have to come up with a cultural event. So it has changed the way I am in, in, in school. So we see that as, uh, as ripple effects of what we do in the community. Children go to school more often. Their, their scores in school have gone higher. They're reading better. They're understanding better. They're assimilating better. Yeah. That's interesting. I think uh, even saving one life, like you said, can cause, uh, can get you so much satisfaction. Yeah. Um, so the same person has another question as well. Uh, what were the responses and reactions of children of the Hasiru Dala community? Did they enjoy it? Uh, of libraries? Uh, specifically? Or yeah, I think it's no, an I ongoing think project. So. Sorry, yeah, I didn't talk, I, think talk, I think he's talking more about the wider community because you've already spoken about the children and uh, yeah, so the yeah, that's wonderful you asked it. So one of the things that we have seen that over the, when we the first year we started, I think parents were just happy that there is something that the child after school is not on the streets, it has a space to go. So they had very little idea about what it was. So when we started, everybody thought it was free tuitions. And uh, so it took, took a lot of time to even articulate what it is that we want to do because this, this is a community, many communities don't have libraries, this especially. Uh, so it took a while for the community to understand, but more and more, and especially during this pandemic, I think it has been brilliant that the parents now know what happens in the libraries because we are running online sessions, we are running sessions on calls, we are going in the, into the community sometimes whenever possible and uh, you know, giving away ch things to children and instructing things uh, children to do with work at home. That's Parts of what used to happen in the library now plays out in their own homes. So they're able to see what actually happens because they, they believe their children are very busy from morning to evening. You know, they have activities to do and this to complete and these answers to give and this book to read. And so they, they are busy. So I think the impact of the work, they are now able to see because it plays out in their own homes. Yeah, parents are happy when children are busy. <laughs> <laughs> So the next question is from Taran Mendi, who asked, how much time did it take to win the community's trust? And how did you do it? Well, I'm, one cannot always say that I have all the trust and all of that. But uh, yes, it has been a process. Like I said, that uh, the advantage that we had, Tarun, was that um, we first started to work with the parents. And then we started working with the children. So Hasiru Dala started working with the waste pickers, um, you know, uh, and we as, as a mem member, I mean, we, we, we uh, for example, one of the work that we did was to get the municipality in Bangalore to recognize them as, uh, 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 you know, and provide them with the occupational ID cards for many families and many ways, because that was the first document of identity that they ever had. Um, so, so that kind of work had already happened. A lot of policy level changes had happened for waste because they had the first right to waste, especially dry waste. So, uh, so there was trust in the organization. Uh, and so I think a lot of it, we were in on, we started on a good footing because we, we had that trust from the parents. Gaining trust of the children is completely a different ball game uh, because they have the mind of their own and they, they, they test and turn you as much as possible. That has, and I think arts is a, as as um, uh, arts based educators and practitioners, that is very important because arts creates a very non threatening environment. It is not like school. They know it's not school, and it is an extremely informal space. So a child is, 
every child who comes to that space is coming out of his or her own will. There is no child who is forced to come there. So if, if some days we have 50, 60 children and, uh, and they are ready to come when they want to come, they leave when they... So it is a semi-formal environment. And I think that works because it's a semi-formal environment uh, and it is open to all. So one of the things that we keep hearing from all the children is that we love coming to the library because this is the only place that we can you know, be friends with everybody. In the communities, that is not possible. You know, in the communities, there are rules to be who you can be friends with or not. But in the library, there is no. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Kritika, who asked, how can the government support such initiatives? Do you think uh, government involvement is best for such programs? I think, Kanika, good question, because I think, uh, because we are trying to make a case for it as well. Community libraries, uh, very little money that the government puts into libraries and public libraries in the first place. So our libraries are dying, which is bad news. Uh, our libraries don't have programs that bring people into the library. So they're, they're mostly looked at as, you know, architectural marvels, basically, like in Bangalore, we have one. Uh, and uh, they are just, there is a, a, some sort of nostalgia about libraries. And most people who are going to the libraries are also people who are in universities, who are, you know, researching on this thing or that. There is no programs that bring brings the poor into the library, that brings the under disadvantaged, underserved communities into the libraries. So our government is not putting in thought or money into it right now, and it's unfortunate. But I, uh, we are in the process of forming something uh, like a community library network within the country. And we are hoping that through our um, you know, uh, efforts, maybe we will be able to make a case for it. And I hope the government responds. I hope they do as well. Um, the next question is from Anjali Thakur, uh, who says, how would you integrate technology and information literally, literacy skills into your work with the community? So interestingly, uh, when we started, uh, we, we have been extremely old school about how we do. We've, we've really minimized the amount of technology, the entry of a technology into our schools uh, and, and into our library programs, because I, we still believe it's still five years on, only. It's a small, young program even now. Most of the work that the children, most of what the children needed at that point when we entered the communities and we saw the children was human connect. And that is where we wanted to place because the, the children that we work with have gone through major neglect, emotional neglect, physical neglect, psychological neglect. So uh, a device will never be able to place, replace that. You know, so knowing a device can only be a facilitator or, a, you know, a, in, in some way help in certain things. So and not be driven by technology. That is a call that we have taken. Of course, now during the pandemic, we do use the technology, but we can't wait for the day when we can go back. In fact, in between, uh, you know, uh, the uh, first and the second wave also, we had our libraries open. Uh, so, yeah, so. I really believe that there, we will be using technology, but that will may not be the only, I mean, that in terms of priority, we have other priorities as well. Okay. Um, I have a question from Peter who asks, how do you consider informal education in acquiring reading and writing skills? Is formal education better than informal? Uh, what is his name? I'm sorry, what yeah. is the question? Yeah. Amita? Peter. Amita? Peter. 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 Uh, Peter, okay. Peter, I can't see you, so I hope uh, uh, this gets to you. Uh, I don't know. I wonder about what are the things that we can reflect about that we learned with more joy, you know? Uh, uh, I wonder how many of us remember our first day or in sixth class and what was taught that day. But we may have to remember the first time we, you know, spotted a rainbow, somebody showed it to us more kindly and uh, told us what the colors mean, right? So a lot of our learning is integrated with its experience of learning. So uh, many times we remember things because how we experience that learning. So uh, that is the difference between formal and informal uh, education. So when, when, when we look for non-formal education or alternate spaces, it emphasizes on the experience of learning rather than the matter in the learning itself. 
So that is the gap. So we are looking at experiential education and in the form of libraries and reading and all of that. So, and we have, I mean, I'm, if I have a minute to just conclude, uh, so when we started, we never started with, you know, letters A, B, this is C. No, we didn't do any of that. We started reading stories to children. Our first attempt was to make children fall in love with stories and what these books contain, that they're precious, that they're stories that have, that open wonderful worlds to them. So, uh, that while we started to read aloud and stories and slowly we started to see how children pick up uh, language and reading. So that was interesting because, uh, and as, as we read now more about it, we see that the pedagogy of read aloud itself shows us that as we read aloud more and more to children, they naturally pick up the language. One does not have to sit and do A, B, C, D. And they pick up at a pace that is way faster than the other children who go through you know, a, a very ro rote learning kind of experience. Uh, Peter also has another question. Yes. Uh, he asks, what is the reaction of the boys and the parents and the neighbors on them learning how to cook? Did they practice it outside in their homes? Yeah, I mean, I hope they did because the whole cooking thing has really caught on. So what we did was as a part of the presentation of the one year, every library at the end of one year, we have a presentation which is open to the community of basically shows what we did in that year. Uh, the the boys had uh, set up stalls, you know, of everything that they'd cooked. So uh, bhel puri, pani puri, uh, all of these things came out, pizzas and cookies that they had made. So yeah, the, I think the, the mothers were mighty surprised and impressed. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. <laughs> um, so while I wait for uh, some more audience questions, I have a question of my own. Um, so in our last conversation, when we spoke, you had said that the world is going to need healing for many years to come after this pandemic. In view of this, what are your plans for your community or in general? Too early to plan right away, Kanika, because we are still in the middle of the second wave. I mean, still every day we are handling COVID cases with children. We are fighting with the government to make sure that, you know, uh, enough resources are spared for the uh, urban poor. Uh, but... Uh, uh, I think few things we should learn is to, and, and keep in mind was for me especially would be to go back and strengthen my uh, therapy program, strengthen the way we look at our programs from a space of understanding, articulating and healing. Um, but I think community libraries and community projects are going to be uh, the spaces that we require for the community to heal because it's, it's, we, there will be, I mean, as we speak, I don't know, crores and crores of families have, the pandemic has changed their lives forever, you know, either through migration or through death or through, I don't know, disappearances. There's so many, so many stories. I mean, we, every day you hear of, uh, you know, often children, you hear of parents who've lost all their children. So this is, this is a distress and it is a tragedy that is, I don't know, of, of a, some different degree. And it's not like when tomorrow, and this pandemic will end, I think it will end. I mean, I was, <laughs> don't worry, because I was looking at, uh, you know, um, uh, footages from the Spanish flu, for example, which happened a century ago. It lasted for three years or so, and it did end. But when, when it does end, for us to remember where we were before this and what happened to us, and not really think that tomorrow everything is set to normal and we start, you know, or doing the things, let's forget about the pandemic make let's forget about this distress let's forget about all of this and start running no we all need you know spaces to talk articulate heal from our experiences and i think community projects are going to play a huge role in that yeah i agree i mean right now there are too many uncertainties and one doesn't know what's going to happen next but as long as we you know have some idea of what uh, like the human connect i think like you said is going to be a big thing uh, we have another question from Akhila on Zoom who asks that he, he wants to know about your journey of navigating the cultural and linguistic barriers in your work. Lovely question. Uh, so one of the things that uh, Kanika, what's his name? Sorry. Uh, Akhila. Akhila. 
Okay, Akhila, one of the things that we did was uh, that our library should reflect the languages of our community, you know? So uh, in our community, we have, uh, I think at least four to five different languages that are spoken. So to have, whether the children read those books or not, to have books of those communities. And we, what we consciously did was, if it is a language that the children cannot read, we would bring volunteers who can read in those languages because I think every child should, no child should be deprived of listening to literature of their, from their mother tongue. You know, it, it's a huge, uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful to do that. And every child, that should be a child's growing experience. The language and literature should be a part of it, the child's memory scape, mind scape, everything. Uh, so, and it was interesting because we once started to see after sometimes when we children started to borrow books that, for example, Tamil is not, the children speak in Tamil, but they don't read in Tamil. But the Tamil books started to disappear. The children started to, uh, you know, borrow books in Tamil. And it was later we realized that it's because their parents are reading it. You know, the parents may not be highly educated. They might be fifth standard pass or 10th standard pass. That's so they, they are too shy to come and borrow children's books, but they are very interested in reading and they are interested in stories. And we were like mighty, mighty happy about it because that was a way that the parents, and we were looking at children's and adult, uh, you know, literacy together at that point. So uh, to not have, a uh, language ad agenda is very, very important. Like in the libraries, we read Kannada books, we read English books, we read Tamil books. So to library space or a community space to reflect the languages of the community is very important. That's interesting because parents do play a huge role, no matter what. Yeah. That is. Um, I think this is the last question that we'll take from Amaya who says that there are a large number of community libraries that have come up in, in India. Is there any plan to leverage resources together? Um, you, had, you had also spoken about a Delhi um, community library that you had taken some inspiration from. So I think her question is that, is there any plan to leverage resources together amongst all the community libraries? Yeah, so as we speak, we are in the process of uh, uh you know, coming together and forming a community library network, I mean, more formally, and to be able to think about what are the things. See, unfortunately, what has happened is, uh, I don't know how many of you know, in the middle of the pandemic, we've had uh, changes in the uh, in, in how um, in NGOs are sponsored, especially specifically to do with FCRA. So a lot of community li libraries were dependent on uh, were dependent on subgranting and all of them had very slow deaths. So it is important that those who have survived uh, get together and work together. You know, and um, so yes. So as we speak, we are getting together and putting our minds to it and seeing what can we do. As I, and and yesterday I was on a call with one these friends who with whom we are going to be together. Uh, and I was noticing how every community library is doing relief work, you know. So uh, it is the it is the it is in our way to jump into the community and do what is necessary at that point. Thank you so much, Lakshmi. That was a really nice conversation. I think we all learned a lot and uh, we hope to be inspired and contribute to your cause. Um, thank you so much once again. Sure. Thank yes, you. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you, everybody. I can't see you, but uh, I, I hope uh, you all had a good time listening in. If you all have questions, more questions, I welcome your questions. I think my uh, my email ID is lakshmikarunakaran at gmail.com. It'll be great if you can, uh, you know, uh, give it to uh, the audience at any point. If they want to uh, write to me, please feel free. So I'll be able to answer your questions. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Lakshmi, the, it's really, it's been so interesting listening to, uh, you know, the unique concept and the, uh, you know, the interesting and very, very inspirational work that you're doing. It's been, been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much. Thank and you. I hope everyone else has enjoyed the program as well. Thank you. Thank you. I'd also like to just take a moment and thank both Kanika and Lakshmi. Um, I mean, in this one hour, you've spoken about so many things. Um, Lakshmi, you said it's a very young project, but I think the impact that it's had already is so large. 
and uh, we hope you continue to grow. Uh, but I'd also like to thank my colleagues, Borat Carnegie, as well as the Vedika program um, to sort of help curate this. This has been wonderful. Um, thank you everyone for your time and uh, I wish you all a good evening ahead. Thank you. Thank you.